Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from four very exciting countries all across of Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Hey, by Alexis. From Belgium. Bonjour. Audrey. Hey, from France. Alessio. Very excitedly. Hello. And I'm your host, Fen. And today we're going to be looking at some of the finest games in their respective categories. We're going to start with the Kickstarter darling, Cora Quest, then take the Tentatious main topic, Obsession, before closing out with a brief artistic reflection of Canvas and its new expansion, Reflections. But first we'll start with the standee catch-up. Audrey, what have you been up to? Not really much, to be honest. Uh, with my husband, we played a few games of Gloomhaven uh, few games of Gloomhaven uh, last weekend we did uh, three scenarios but we did twice one scenario to to make it and then another one and I think on the board gaming side that's all for me I keep painting not really much to show these days but not really much to show these days but stuff is happening. And I hover it in my airbrush just uh, an hour ago. I'm waiting till it rests to be able to finish my cars for Marvel Crisis Protocol. That's all for me. What about you, Alexis? Well, uh, what about you, Alexis? Well, uh, on my side, board game wise, uh, I've pl- well, not really board game, uh, more like tabletop games. I've played a game of. Um, Mothership recently. Uh, I am planning to to play some uh, ultraviolet grassland soon, so that has been exciting. Uh, on the board game side, um, and I was supposed to play a little bit more with my family. Unfortunately, my mother caught COVID, so we couldn't go there. So uh, maybe maybe next time. And uh, what about you, Alessio? Oh well, not that much. I let's see. I'm kind on on uh, Arcana. I'm basically losing every game I play. I, th- I I'm beginning to think I suck at the at the game. But is it still your favorite? Game? Uh, one it's favorite. one of my favorite card game. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, I I'm down. I'm down. Uh, losing streak. So uh, at uh, I I'm down. I'm down. Uh, losing streak. So uh, at least I am on a de- decent winning streak online on Concordia. So that kind of balances stuff. Probably I'm not concentrated. I'm not focused enough on Res Arcana. So. And uh, uh, I'm not focused enough on Res Arcana, so. And uh, uh, besides that, uh, well, I played kind of a lot of Cora Quest, meaning that it's only for weekends since it's for the kids, mostly. <laughs> but we will talk about that uh, soon enough. And uh, besides that, besides that, but, well, I'm waiting for a lot of Kickstarters to arrive, so um, he's betting is basically playing the waiting game uh, i won't say the names of the kickstarters because when this episode airs actually they will uh, be already in our hands so <laughs> what about you fan well um i literally just this morning uh received uh delivered by my dog um uh, my my copy of tomo and izanagi from sankakushin I got a special numbered one. We'll post the picture. No, it's private. Ready. Fan yeah. will release this picture. Um, as yes, but uh, <laughs> the dog took the box from the delivery lady and um, ran around with it a bit, but luckily nothing got damaged. She was very excited about it. Uh, I have. Ooh, I've been playing a fair bit of Marvel Champions because you know when you're tired of one boss battler, play a different one. Uh, It's really good. And uh, I'm now just waiting, still waiting for the rest of my final guild stuff to turn up. And uh, Well, apart from that, it's it's been a lot of work involving wood here. Wood here. You know, on top of finishing the cabinet, now it's been dealing with a load of firewood. Oh, I I will try the wood chuck, uh, chucking wood. uh, uh, I I don't know how it's called... Tongue uh, loosener, like tongue twister. Well, yeah. It, it, Monkey Island Two gave us the answer to that riddle, which is three kilograms. So the rest <laughs> of it is, it, it, yeah, it's a bit pointless. 
Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's it's just been board games and uh, life as usual. Uh, we are mostly hiding out. I have had my third uh, COVID booster. Yes, there's all things well we'll be talking about in the podcast. Well, yeah, I, I barely survived it. So uh, let's move on now to uh, well, one one of the darlings of the podcast. Uh, here's Alexis, ready to lead the way into Cora Quest. Specifically, Alexis is one of the darling of the podcast. Is one of the darling of the podcast. <laughs> Because everyone is one of darling of the podcast. I think that everybody know about it, but I'm still going to uh, to remind people. CoreQuest is probably the most uh, wholesome, nicest Kickstarter out there. It's a tiny project from a father and his daughter to make a board out there. It's a tiny project from a father and his daughter to make a board game together. And I got to say, before we talk about the game, the entire project was just perfect. The game was small, cheap, wholesome, the communication was on point. They uh, very much kept to their deadlines. They did everything uh, They did everything uh, well. It just went without a hitch while being a very cute story. Uh, I think that that just by itself, even if the game wasn't good, that would deserve to be to be pointed out. That this was just a great project by itself. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have to, yeah, I, I, I have to agree. I just, I really want to agree and just say, like, uh, at for doing a first project, like, they kept it small, they kept it simple, they had most of the work already done on the game design before they went in. It, it just like 10 out of 10 on getting this done it's completed really quickly and like 10 out of 10 on getting this done it's completed really quickly and i'm super happy with the and, final and the, the whole fact that it was a family project is just perfect too yeah yeah it is exactly the, that and uh and selling a game about kittens is just how you win the internet it's very <laughs> talk properly about the game exe- itself i just want to make very clear one little um, caveat. Uh, The game was aimed at a young public, so you might find enjoyment in it uh, as an adult, but it's primarily aimed at kids. So uh, you can see it as um, Adventure Time or Steven Universe or whichever show them, but it's important to know that um, anything that I'll talk about is going to be... People don't die. Uh, no, that being said, Core Quest is an amazing game that fulfills its uh, given goal perfectly. It's a dungeon crawler inspired by AirQuest, Gloom Event, uh, Event uh, Gloom Event or Descent, but with simplified mechanics. It managed to capture the essence of dungeon exploration games without getting too simple, but it remains tactical and engaging through a few smart additions that we'll go over in a moment. Uh, the way that the game will go over in a moment. Uh, the way that the game plays in general is very uh, easy. It comes with 10 quests laid out in a quest book that details how to generate the dungeon deck, as well as a few events that will happen when you land on specific tile, uh, usually telling a specific story. Uh, on top of the losing and winning a specific story. Uh, on top of the losing and winning condition of the dungeon, the dungeon deck is written in a very storybook style. Um, the, the stories that happen feel very uh, very much out of um, uh, some some kids book. Uh, it's very it's very simple, very wholesome. It's very simple, very wholesome, very nice. Uh, the quest feel a little bit like a Saturday morning cartoon show. Uh, sometimes little events and mini games disrupt the normal dungeon rules. So how it plays is that you're going to have your dungeon deck, you start at the dungeon entrance, and as you play the game, you're going to turn up tile uh, from the dungeon deck and uh, from the dungeon deck and slowly explore the randomly generated dungeon um, with a few specific event tiles uh, set up to the, the deck that you know when they'll come and uh, find out the different little areas of the dungeon. It might be a bus, it might be a specific, tra- uh, specific treasure track, tra- uh, Treasures. You fight enemies with a very simple uh, dice system. Uh, you roll a certain number of dice that are either a 3 6 or a 2 6 chance of hitting each time you you, um, you roll. Uh, finding and using items or looking for those uh, special event style. Um, three mechanics that I feel make it slightly more complex and interesting without losing its uh, kid friendliness. 
Uh, first of all, if you miss all of your attack roll, you flip your character's card to a determinant style, uh, which grants you an extra dice of damage. It's a good way to mitigate uh, luck. It's a good way to mitigate uh, luck and frustration, and it's very welcome in a game aimed, aimed for kids because nobody wants to constantly roll uh, zeros and constantly miss your attack. Um, here, even if you uh, miss everything, you still get that little reward. Uh, on top of the dungeon deck, there's a marker. You roll uh, zeros and constantly miss your attack. Um, here, even if you uh, miss everything, you still get that little reward. Uh, on top of the dungeon deck, there's a marker. If you don't turn a tile over at the end of your turn, you move down uh, an urgency marker down a track. Once it reaches the bottom of that track in your turn, you move down uh, an urgency marker down a track. Once it reaches the bottom of that track, it spawns spiders into the dungeon. It's a good way to add a countdown to the game uh, without feeling it too arbitrary or time limited. Uh, you can dispatch the spiders, but as the game goes on, you don't want to stay around in it. It allows them to heal an ally, sometimes to avoid damage, or to buff someone to their determined side. It's simple, but it adds a little bit of complexity that is very welcome in this game. And finally, the last thing I want to bring up before we, uh, we open it to, to everybody, um, is that the game is fully customizable with them into the game. So it's very easy to do. Uh, even your kids could, could do it with, um, uh, with that book, but I doubt that we won't see a lot of um, fair and fun uh, fan-made quests and content for the game online. I think that, this, think that this is very much a game that will have a, a pretty good community around it. Overall, Core Quest is a warm and fuzzy, wholesome game that I truly enjoyed and I would recommend to anybody with uh, kids that they want to initiate to board games and to something a little bit more uh, complex than something a little bit more uh, complex than whatever game um, is adapted to their age usually. Um, and I think that everybody here uh, that played it, I think that Audrey didn't yet. Nope, I haven't. Played with a kid. Yeah, I, I don't have don't have kids around. Yeah, that's it. Unless my husband counts, which wouldn't be very nice. Unless my kid counts, <laughs> but he can't chuck dice. So. Um, how did your kid liked it, Alessio? Oh, uh, actually, he loved it, and I have to say, uh, after the first game, he wanted to create his own character. So that's, uh, the, uh, I think that's the the, the best measure of a, the success of a game when a small kid is so enthusiastic about it that he wants to create content for it. So uh, I I think that uh, the, the this game he. He all his goals, all his, all his marks, all his marks uh, perfectly, because uh, actually, it it makes you want to play again. If you are with your family, this game is really, as you said, wholesome. So uh, everyone wants to play again, and uh, if you some, so uh, everyone wants to play again, and uh, if you don't don't succeed because it happened. Uh, you don't feel punished for it, you just retry, the, there's an ending for you being unsuccessful and that's cool. And uh, that's just for being unsuccessful and that's cool. And uh, that's just for the sensation of the game. Uh, that how That's how the game feels, but I, I have to say, uh, you can see with a bit of an, uh, an analytical eye that uh, there's a lot of effort to make the game modular. You see in treasure cards, you see in how characters and monsters are created. Uh, there are uh, not the widest array of choices, but everything is modular and you can combine it uh, any way you want and you like. So this game, I, I think it can make it your own, really. I think there's a lot of things competing for best quality in this, but it it is good that you can customize it, and they're so open to customizing. And they go here, here's assets, here's a place you can do it. Go nuts! Yeah, yeah, and and here's the exact rules on how to allow them to to do what they want with it. 
Yeah, actually, you you can see it. One point of moment uh, equals two points or two hit points. You can see how weapons swap range for dice effectiveness or strength. You have given you are given uh, a chart of how weapon strength is done. Uh, it is a work for kids, but it's. Uh, uh, for very smart kids, <laughs> I, I I would I I don't want to offend kids. I love kids. Uh, anyway, there's more. This game does a lot of things right in its simplicity. I I wanted to compare it very recent games. Actually, uh, yeah, let's say recent. Hero Quest. Uh, take Hero Quest. <laughs> uh, it, it's not exactly <laughs> recent, but it got a reprint. So you have a uh, movement value and you can move and you can move freely also exploration is very simple and way of pushing you forward that's done better than hero quest given that hero quest is from uh what the late 80s 1989 uh, i would hope that it's modern yeah, <laughs> yeah. recent release 1989 yeah, hero quest. Hero yeah quest. of course uh, <laughs> anyway after that, Warhammer Quest Cursed City, which is actually a problem in the most basic uh, version of the mission you do, which is that you don't feel pushed to go forward. Uh, you can just take your time and eventually win everything uh, on the basic mission. There are four kinds of mission in that game. And the way of pushing you, if you are not doing anything with spiders, the countdown mechanic, and the way of pushing you, if you are not doing anything with spiders, the countdown mechanic, is actually very very smart it works perfectly and uh, uh, since you are playing with a team and in your team there could be kids it works perfectly with kids it's uh, <laughs> team and in your team there could be kids it works perfectly with kids it's uh, <laughs> it's a real scare it's great while um, while, while playing that uh, the game uh, I was thinking about Midra's way yeah, I was going to say that about the urgency. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it, uh, it, uh, Coral Quest somehow felt better than Midera because Midera sometimes I felt like I wouldn't want to, to kill an enemy or to go too fast because otherwise it could leave for uh, too many turns without getting to the exit. Uh, with Coral Quest, you have a pretty slack timer and so the urgency is there, but you never just, uh, you randomly lose the quest if, you, if the urgency yeah. timer gets too slow uh, here it's actually yeah. you fight more um, it, it also it also is kind of akin to i know some people here don't want to hear much about that game but uh in tainted gray with the event deck where <laughs> at the end you have a card that have six uh, rotations depending on the amount of player that says hey you have to move and um as well one other game which uh, was my first foray into modern game let's say um which was super dungeon um which has <laughs> as well no no thing to to make it has <laughs> as well no no thing to to make you push forward in the previous version so it's better to just grind at the, at the entrance yeah you, you can grind on the first tile and you don't have any incentive to go forward and yeah i think that having something to, that makes you go forward is nice having something that having something to, that makes you go forward is nice having something that's not black or white to make you move forward is even better and also when you mentioned the customability of the game I, th I think that's one thing that many 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 dungeon crawlers miss because once you have the ties you have those i mean many people that play dungeon crawlers are role-playing uh persons so they can still imagine uh a new universe they can still imagine a quest they can still imagine things to do events but the balance having a guide for this balance i think that's something very yeah, smart yeah definitely yeah uh, also, the, the mechanic of spawning monsters, yeah, you, you flip the card, you already know where on the card the monsters go, and basically what the monsters are. So, you don't have to basically do anything, the game plays itself. Um, we talked about how an app makes a dungeon crawler easier because it keeps the book here, because it keeps the bookkeeping for you. This is the opposite approach, you just don't have... A, to keep uh, nothing, to uh, to annotate nothing, and it manages to be fun. Fan, did you did you played it yet? 
I didn't. I'm waiting until the nieces and nephews come to visit before we can play. And I didn't. I'm waiting until the nieces and nephews come to visit before we can play. And of course, because the they're Swedish, they also need to be a bit older because they're not all of them are confident in their English. So that's it's more likely something we'll play a bit later on. Um, but I did want to say uh, that one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, is if you look at the side of the box, you can see all of the children who sent in ideas and designs and everything. And it's really cool that they've all been like given their first names stuck on the side of the box. Super sweet. Yes. Uh, also, uh, so yeah. many of them are girls. Which just shows how the original Hero Quest was in. All the characters were male. The new one has female characters. But this one, no, we've got Wizard Woman. Wizard Woman, I love it. Not a witch. Wizard, not a Wizard Woman. And Sword Girl, who was in a wheelchair. Like, hell yeah. Give us characters yes. like that. Uh, and and, and, and my favourite by... character I want to play, Robo Kettle. I want to be a kettle, <laughs> a robot kettle. This is amazing. This is the best character in any dungeon crawler ever. There's either cat. I don't care about being a cat. I want to be a hey, kettle. Don't say I that want about to. Cat. <laughs> I didn't. I said I don't want to be a cat. I didn't say the cat was bad. A cat. <laughs> I didn't. I said I don't want to be a cat. I didn't say the cat was bad. I said I wanted to be a kettle, a robotic <laughs> kettle. And we're gonna scold the heck out of all of you. Anyway, yeah, so I like how accessible, like obviously a kettle, a robot, very non-binary, love it. Uh, and uh, Halfling with a catapult, super cute. Kettle, a robot, very non-binary, love it. Uh, and uh, Halfling with a catapult, super cute as well. Yeah. Uh, someone would argue that uh, a robot is absolutely binary. No, they're either <laughs> they're not. <laughs> They're <laughs> really not. You might as well argue that every human is binary because we use every human is binary because we use ones and zeros in the processing of our brain. Exactly. Yes. That um, was a bad programmer's joke. It was a very bad programmer I, joke. It was a very good programmer joke. Maybe we should cut it entirely and just leave me saying we should cut that terrible programmer joke. Don't cut anything. <laughs> we, we, we will just keep. Uh, anyway, yes. I I also got. News from uh, from David uh, that played the game. Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't he couldn't be with us today. But uh, he played the game a bunch with his wife and his kid. Uh, his kid is a little bit too young for the game, so uh, David is asked to play a, a bit of a dungeon. I think that his kid is four years old, so it's very young, but he still managed to enjoy and interact with the game. Um, and uh, he really likes it. He, he, he enjoys it a lot. And he enjoys that you can play the game without having uh, any monster dying. Uh, you can, like, you're trying to convince a monster or to do a race against monster to try to um, uh, win them to your side, basically, is how he, he explained it. Uh, and I think that's Can you shoo sweet. them away? The shoo! <laughs> exactly. That makes uh, Kettle Robot even better. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to fight people. I'm going to serve them British and then leave the dungeon in a Brexit form. <laughs> um, so yeah, this this game I think is going to uh, be really loved by the community in general. Um, I don't think that it's going to be. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be. Uh, a hit with everybody given it's it's a uh, more child uh, friendly approach but i think that any uh, bold gamer that has kids uh should get that game and just play it with them because this is just a perfect uh game to, this is just a perfect uh game to to introduce player with uh, it's very tiny. It's very cheap. It's aimed at uh, i i would say that any kid between 6 and 14 uh, should engage with it like extremely well uh, older than 14 the older than 14 the might be a little bit too it might be a bit too childish for them but um, yeah this, this is just a just a perfect kickstarter and I think yeah. this needs to be uploaded this is your gateway drug for your kids to get them hooked onto more and more excessive dungeon crawlers <laughs> onto more and more excessive dungeon crawlers <laughs> so they can get to grips with all the basic stuff yeah um, good job if you want to prepare the dungeon exploring team that's where you start yes yes 
in addition to uh, uh, like you said, it's really good and enjoyable. It's worth noting that currently with 253, it's worth noting that currently with 253 ratings, it is an 8.7 on Board Game Geek, which means it's already Oof, ranking. Yeah. It's only ranking at 3,696 because of the weighting system. But yeah, it, like I this should, is universally. I vote on that. Yes, if you own it, you really should get your rating on there. Yeah. This is universally liked by the people. Every expectation that I had for it, and even a little bit more. Yeah, it's probably right. Better than expected in everything. The box is smaller than expected, and the materials are better than expected for the low cost. And it's also getting published regularly and not through Kickstarter again. So uh, it is better on everything. Yeah. Eli, clap. That is, I just, I don't even clap when I'm at a concert or in theatre or anything. Maybe like, so you can't get a better clap than that. I, I am on push to talk, so I cannot clap. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you, say... you, can, you can clap because Allah has it in your audio and I can just edit it. <laughs> audio and I can just edit it. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I clapped. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, is this, uh, uh, to conclude, I think that this is just the perfect game to pick up and get on your table whenever you have the Vicantes and the local, and get on your table whenever you have the Vicantes and the local lord around when you have your afternoon tea. Uh, speaking of uh, having the Vicantes and the uh, count around to, to play some games. Uh, no, then, no, I, no, 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 later, you, you, later. No, 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 no. Oh dear, you can't do the, you can't do the transition here because unfortunately <laughs> we're going from one but small bar. Something to say. Go on then, Audrey, say it. This is a complete mess. This is what happens when you bring a child's game into the podcast. Everyone just like ah. degenerates and goes, ooh. <laughs> Go on, Audrey, say it. Ah, I just saw that you updated it. No, yes. I, I was just going to say that the, the kettle has the robot kettle. Yeah. Let him rogue. speak. Let him speak. Yes, we're going from one small cardboard dungeon to an even tinier one because I want to take a rapid looting of Mini Rogue from Nuts Publishing before we move on. Going to be only five minutes because, um, like, I got this last weekend and I have been obsessed with it and I'm like, I need to talk. get this in English or in French. Um, it is a card deck based one or two player dungeon crawler primarily aimed at solo but you can play it with a partner cooperatively. Um, you have a character at the start. You have a little board that tracks XP, health, gold, food, armor, and some potions. The partner cooperatively. Um, you have a character at the start. You have a little board that tracks XP, health, gold, food, armor, and some potions. You have a dungeon made of 10 levels, and uh, each level is laid out of nine cards. From a random deck with one card representing a boss of each. You have a dungeon made of ten levels, and uh, each level is laid out of nine cards. From a random deck with one card representing a boss of each. Like every other floor or so it is, it's a little bit more than that, but some floors will have a boss on them. Your goal is to get all the way through all the floors, get to the bottom, and kill all the very big swords. And this game is just so easy to learn so easy to play and replay and really quick like you'll just you start off in the top left corner of the of the three by three grid you you deal with that room it might say be a trap or some treasure or a monster that you'll fight because it's randomized but you get to sort of be like okay i'm gonna fight a monster next door oh i i fancy going to this merchant which is um it's super like nice to have that bit of input randomness where you look at the situation and go well i'm going to deal with this or i'm a bit too badly injured to go face a, a a random monster at this point um i just i got obsessed with it i really did uh i i have one i don't have two of the expansions i almost said one because one of the expansions does nothing except give you foil cards for the bosses and the treasure and i kind of love it I, I kind of love it. I got it. I replaced all. Uh, I, I have one. I don't have two of the expansions. I almost said one. Because one of the expansions does nothing except give you foil cards for the bosses and the treasure. And I kind of love it. I, I kind of love it. I got it. I replaced all of the bosses and the treasure card and the ghost with shiny foil ones. And I went, this feels really decadent. I like this. Kind of love it. I got it. I replaced all of the bosses and the treasure card and the ghost with shiny foil ones. And I went, this feels really decadent. I like this. Um, 
I don't. I wouldn't have bought it if I'd known it was just bling, but I didn't read when I ordered it. I was just like, ooh, I want to get a copy of Mini, just a cosmetic upgrade. Oh, well, it's kind of cool. I'm all right with that for once. Um, so it's fantastic. It's It's got just enough strategy to be interesting. It's It can play at different scaling difficulties. It's quite hard. You have to manage your food. You want to try and hold on to gold. You've got a nice mechanic, the three, um, but it costs you either XP, meaning you slow down your development, or it costs you health. And that can get to be, when you're like 10 health, you're like, oh, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just spend whatever. And then suddenly you're on three health and you're looking, and you're going, this thing kills me in a single hit. So it does feel like a roguelike in a box and playing it around 30 minutes. Love it. Absolutely love it. So yeah, on several levels, it makes me think to something close but not uh, same as One Deck Dungeon. Yes, that's a big part of the reason I picked it up. The solo board game community been raving about it. I read a little bit and I went. The solo board game community been raving about it. I read a little bit and I went. This reminds me of One Deck Dungeon, but different enough, uh, and it is quite different from One Deck Dungeon to play through. So it's like it's 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 cool. And uh, it's it actually one to play. Yes. Sounds great. So what? Yeah. So even better. So what? Yeah. So even better. Yeah. So this is from, um, as I said, Nuts Publishing. It's designed by Paolo Di Stefano and uh, Gabriel Gendron, who Gabriel also did the artwork. I like the artwork. It's a lineless vector, like shape-based artwork. Vector, like shape-based artwork. Uh, very good for the theming and the design. I have one complaint, which is the boards are single layer, and you can go to their website and buy double layer boards for 15 euros. Please, if you do another release edition of this, just put those into the game, because double layer boards, if you can do double layer boards, do love double layer boards, because it's so much nicer looking, it's so much easier to operate. I would have paid an extra 10 euros on the price of this game, uh, to get the double layer boards and funnily enough it seems like everyone agrees because I go to their website and that's they're sold out of the double layer mats so so please <laughs> that that's it I thought like since we talked about core request and we talked about one deck dungeon previously and I need to get that out of my head to maybe stop being obsessed with it but I'm gonna go play it a bit later today I think uh, that's mini rogue uh, and I thoroughly recommend so that done and my little sales pitch cleared it's time that we all clean up we get dressed up we check our manners we remember what order to use the silverware for the most part it's the furthest outside inwards very simple uh, and we are going to go and embrace a damn marvelous obsession so this is a one to four player goes up to six players with the expansions uh, how to really like Give it, do it justice. It is a board game version of Pride and Prejudice. Um, you're the head of a respective, a respected but mid 19th century Victorian England in Derbyshire, Derbyshire. Um, your family has like had a terrible time, but uh, there's been a tragedy. These two young Fairchilds, their parents died crossing the channel from France to England. Uh, ill weather took I them. Just shouldn't have. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, and uh, they've just recently moved to be in with their um, their spinster dowerage aunts in the Fairchild mansion, and your family is like, hey, this is our opportunity. We've got a bit of money coming in now. We have got a little bit of an opportunity, uh, like a chance here. We can go for it. We could become respectable. And in essence, and in essence, the goal for each player is to become the most respected house and family within Derbyshire and win the hearts and affections of one of the two Fairchild children. It's a point salad euro act, I think, if I was going to boil the mechanics down. You start off with a small estate, usually five activities, and a bunch of servants, and maybe some bonus for your family, depending on some have more money, some have maybe have a better reputation to start, but you get one unique bonus and you'll have your four family members in your hand. All you do on your turn is you pick an activity, 
you assign the relevant staff to that activity servant as long as they're available. If they're not available because they're tired and having a rest from working previously, tough luck, pick something else to do. Then you choose the guests, the members of the gentry who are going to be relevant. This. The exact event can vary. So, for example, if you play whist, you're going to have to have female members of the gentry playing. But then if you're going like uh, duck hunting or fishing, then they're going to have to be male. Or sometimes like you're having a big grand breakfast, they can be anyone. And you will, they, the guests that arrive will have, so they might need a valet or a lady's maid to attend to them. And then they'll give you rewards, typically money, reputation gains, or uh, more guests, the most common ones. And you can either get common guests, casual guests who are like, uh, they're, they're, they're made up of a mix of down on their luck aristocrats or really reasonable people or scandalous American heiresses. And then there's prestigious guests who they're the creme de la creme, but they require you to have a certain reputation before they'll even touch any of your uh, events and activities because they've and, no, 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 and I've done a lot of stuff. Yes, yes, they really do. A lot of stuff. Yes, yes, they really do require looking after as well. Uh, and this all takes place over the course of one year. Through each season, you will learn what the Fairchilds are interested in, and the person who builds the highest number of victory points for that category of activity next season will have one of the Fairchilds visit, very big guests who give you good rewards, lots of reputation gains, and, and so on for having them. Um, and, and you will cycle through. You will pick activities to build with your paying your money for them, and gradually you'll, you'll construct more and more of an engine to the, the ultimate goal is to do activities to have you attend them and then they will give you more stuff and you can feed that bucket back in and at the end of the game the person with the highest points based on a mixture of guests activities reputation money milestones uh, servants servants are worth points a big servant uh, pile is can be very uh, servants, servants are worth points. A big servant uh, pile is can be very advantageous in many ways. Uh, wins. Um, I I can't I can't express how much I love this game. Like I'm gonna say it right now. The net remaining games I play this year are gonna have to be re like I'm gonna say it right now. The net remaining games I play this year are gonna have to be really good to get ahead of this one in the rankings for this year, because it is just. Oh, I have one complaint, the same complaint everyone has. It kind of looks like ass. Posh <laughs> ass, but still ass. Um, it's very clip art. Uh, the, the artwork is done by Dan himself. So it, it, it's fine. It's very clear. You can follow what everything is supposed to be doing. So the readability is amazing. I just like Ian O'Toole to get his hands on this and do it up. Because he adds so much to a game. I think... I think a third edition with updated us would be, oh, well, you know. I like the uh, guest cards. I do, yeah, they're fun, aren't they? I think that's the best part of the game, but the, the activity tiles uh, for me is the most lacking part. Oh, and the box cover. The... Oh, that's the Fairchild's ha household. How dare you throw anything <laughs> at the Fairchild's? Who are you to say say what's wrong with their house? <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Uh, about, uh, <laughs> about how much fan likes the game, uh, I think you can say they like it uh, five micro badges on BGG account. You can say they like it uh, five micro badges on BGG account. No, yeah, I wouldn't know about that. You... You call the game a point salad, and I kind of want to push back a little bit on that because after having playing only yeah, one game with with you and Audrey, a little bit on that because after having playing only yeah, one game with with you and Audrey, one thing that I really enjoyed is that compared to other games that I would uh, happily call uh, point salad, Castles of Burgundy. <clears throat> <laughs> well, th this one mostly just uh, rewards you for. Well, th this one mostly just uh, rewards you for almost everything that you do into the game. So there's, well, there's definitely actions that are a lot more, uh, a lot better for your end game. 
um, it rarely feels like you invest time and energy towards something that will not be rewarded. Like I am an energy towards something that will not be rewarded. Like everything that you do will translate into victory points at the end. Um, and it's always interesting to, you, you're always rewarded even if you uh, have a strategy that's, that's a little bit different or that requires a little bit of involvement towards, it's going to be content towards the end. And I think that's, works really nicely and uh, it makes the game feel a lot less frustrating because with those games it's often annoying to walk out to get a good, good economy and then find out that oh well gold coins worth nothing at the end but if I had spent a little bit more time getting um, this is not how the game functions. Yeah, m maybe you're going to say otherwise but uh, when we played the game and at the beginning Fen uh, explained uh, the game uh, at some point uh, Either I didn't remember if they explained how we score points, or either they didn't, I don't remember. But I had no idea how to win, like, oh, I could do this, oh, that's going to be fun, I'm doing it. Well, I knew that the tiles, for instance, they were the, the points, we had the points on the hands, uh, but I didn't remember, for instance, or uh, Fen didn't say that, uh, that the um, servants were scoring some points at the end, for instance. I did so many yeah. information. The, the, the thing is, is there was a lot of information, and what I was doing is what I do with this game, which is I sit down and I go, okay, these are the layout of the points, and there's a percentage mix of them. Most of them you get from gentry and activities, and then I just launch into, and now we'll start playing, and we learn by playing because it's so easy. To yeah, it, it definitely looks. It looks a lot more complicated than it is, uh, but it has a lot of depth, which is always. Uh, the best way to do things yes. is it to get in uh very deep it is uh it and um I, i'm gonna push back against myself a little bit as well because i kind of not pretty some bits of it are really pretty uh, the uh, each of the families um has their own box that all the starting stuff is put in those boxes are gorgeous oh. they're really like ostentatious and simple very uh, very prestigious uh, mansions upstairs, downstairs, which made me chuckle when um, when when I read that name. That's an old British television show about servants. Um, my parents oh. talk about it, so quite beloved. Uh, and the Wessex expansion and the useful box, which includes the useful man who is really useful, as he man who is really useful, as he should be, uh, all fit in the main box. So I literally have everything ever put in the box oh, that's really good and it's all there and i don't need any of the expansion boxes um which is fantastic briefly gonna mention the expansions the wessex expansion gives you an extra stick briefly gonna mention the expansions the wessex expansion gives you an extra family and a few extra buildings super easy to integrate to the game the box i imagine this extra family is the wessex uh, yes the wessex is i'm so smart yes. yes yes you nailed it 10 out of 10 fantastic um yeah they they fantastic um yeah they 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 get the bonus of starting with either a breakfast um hall or a tennis court so which is actually quite large a bonus and then the, in upstairs downstairs is the howard family who start with a cook and the upstairs downstairs gives you extra servants and i think it must have and the reason for that is the extra servants are the head boy the uh, head housemaid i think it is the um cook and the and then there's the useful man you get in the useful box and these four do a lot to smooth out things because sometimes when you play just core game you cannot be inflexible enough and then what the expansion does is it adds these slightly more flexible uh, servants who can improve your reputation the um, cook can like cook food uh, increasing reputation gains from the activity and allowing guests who normally would be like oh I'm not going there suddenly it's like oh, miss guests who normally would be like oh I'm not going there suddenly it's like oh, miss Mabel's do her wonderful mince pies I think I will come along for a spot of shooting <laughs> even though you lot are far beneath me but for the pies anything for the pies um it's i think that's a reference that i don't have <laughs> no it's just a made of character um it, it's i think that's a reference that i don't have <laughs> no it's just a made of character okay yeah. um 
it, it it just clicks together really nicely and just helps smooth out the engines for everyone. When we played, I just checked right. all the expansions in from the start, and 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 I don't think it added too much in complexity, just in options. No. Yeah, I did. I didn't not. feel uh, the extra complexity, and now that you mentioned it, I did feel uh, the extra flexibility brought in by the uh, other servants. Yeah. Uh, I, that's what I was going to say because the activities are randomized on how you get it. Uh, every every turn, uh, there's like a few more that happen every time that you buy some. Um, sometimes you can feel a little bit tight because the only activities that you you can have are a bit too uh, require a bit too much reputation or the right the wrong kind of gentry for you. But thanks to the the cook and like way to mitigate those uh, those elements. So yeah. Uh, very well thought out uh, expansions uh, that, that just make the game a little bit more flexible. Yeah, uh, also, the, uh, in some places with the, the tiles, uh, the game made me think of when we played uh, Between Two Seats. Though it's not exactly the same, uh, the fact that, uh, yeah, you have the tiles, you have the activities, you can do um, the fact that we had some objectives requiring some tiles, that's what made me think about it, and it was something that I really liked in the cities and castles. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really, you've reminded me, I didn't fully give uh, put them up and use the servants. Once you've completed an activity, you'll flip it over, and on the back side, uh, it, it'll have a little rose to indicate that it's been used. If it shows the rose, you can't ever flip it back again, and then the activity might change a bit. Uh, in some cases, it becomes less valuable, like Wist becomes Casino, and Casino requires more players. So it's nice that they all change that way. And even in some of the expansions, there's really cool ones that constantly flip back and forth. So you've got a little bit of a where do you leave it at the end of the game? Because some of them move from like being sporting to estate and back and forth, which is very cool. Um, and also, I, and some are rough. So yeah, I, I I liked I liked the uh, was it the Queen Suite that you had it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, re I really like. Yeah, you open it. Uh, was it you? You use it, and then a, and a prestigious guest arrives and goes, "I'm going to use this suite," and then it becomes like so and so stayed here, and it's a monument in your uh, in your grounds, and it's just worth it or, uh, in your grounds, and it's just worth X number of points at the end of the game. It's like yeah, something like six or yeah, it was worth wow. a lot, and you just yeah, <laughs> it's it's like um, and then I had a second one like that. Yeah, yeah, you did, you did. There's... Yeah, it, it's a lot like. There's also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. I was just going to put a button on this yeah. one. It's a so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. I was just going to put a button on this yeah. one. It's a lot like in our conservatory. We have a, uh, a a a bench, a padded bench that was slept on by a famous Swedish opera singer, like in the 1920s. Uh, and it has a little memorial plaque on it to say that he slept here. And it has a little memorial plaque on it to say that he slept here. So. That's what I kind of yeah <laughs> seriously it's 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 a big deal it's a hat family heirloom and nobody really wanted it so we took it and <laughs> it's really cool the dog the dog loves it it's her favorite place um, but yeah it's it, it's like that it's like those place heritage sites in the UK where they stayed here um, or lived here for these periods and I like that I was like oh my god that's really cool that's actually something that happens and still is a thing in Britain where so and so stayed at this place and now it's super important and prestigious so yeah i i come from where uh, very close to where i think uh, lived and there is the, the house of standard and you can visit it and it's a bit uh, at some places it's done other places it isn't but here it's his house it's not taken inside another house um what i really liked too is that on the you said um what I really liked too is that on the you said that the game uh, takes place over a year uh, with different events. I, I think that the different events on the timeline also add a lot of uh, strategy to the game because at one point there's the what is it like the national holiday? Yes. Uh, when, yeah. um, what is it like the national holiday? Yes. Uh, when yes, you can, my national when you can holiday. Do, you can do any action regardless of your prestige. Yeah, uh, reputation. I don't remember the the exact term. Anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, you could you could 
you can have any guest at any uh, activity regardless of reputation requirements for that guest or the activity so you you can have reputation one Which... and have reputation six guests going to reputation five activities exactly so you could really plan around those terms you also have a term that allows you to buy any number of building as long as you have the cash so if you plan your terms right and you have error uh, on the early turn you're also able to um, use your butler to to prepare for the fair and if you do that you then get a, a bonus that that triggers a couple of times during the game there's a lot of little uh, element that adds complexity and, and tacticalness too much to handle. Um, I, I think that it's a very uh, clever game. It is. I, 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 you're uh, glad so, you yeah, remind Thank you for... Yeah. Yeah. I was just saying, I'm glad you reminded me of the Village Fair because that's like one of those first decision points you make in the game because the um, planning the Village Fair tile is worth three points at the end of the game. The um, planning the Village Fair tile is worth three points at the end of the game, which is a large amount for an activity tile that you start with. Um, if you flip it, then you get uh, reputation gains and um, extra money every single time the village fair happens, which is twice in the short game and three times in the long game, which is a 20 turn game. Every single time the village fair happens, which is twice in the short game and three times in the long game, which is a 20 turn game. Um, and it's, it's really like tight you have to decide because giving up those points can make all the difference even though the scores trend towards like 200 points by the end of the game just those three can often be making or breaking and i've been like okay turn two i've got to remember to send the butler to the village fair and get this flipped uh -huh. because i don't have any american heiresses like audrey did when we played i have no so idea I... what you're talking about <laughs> yeah that that's something we were going to talk about in a moment as well but uh uh, so so I'm like, I must get it flipped because I need more money. And then I send the butler to get more staff because I'm fair and I look and I'm like, once again, I got caught up doing a load of other things and I did not flip the village fair and I am broke and I am going to be broke for this entire game because that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, wonderful. Th that's the thing that I would say is the great strength of the game. It's that, yes, it's complex, as we said, self-contained, that it doesn't feel that way. And in fact... The complexity is more in the choices, I would say, that in what you can do. Yeah. Um, speaking of stuff you can do, sometimes, uh, like when you attract one of the fair charles to your estate at the end of a season, you get a victory point card. This is worth, like, I don't have it in front of me right now. But also, any time during the game, you can instead flip one up and get a bonus that's listed on the card. You lose the points, but you can get a whole load of really useful things, like refreshing all your guests, which can be huge, because... We haven't even talked yeah, about the guests. It takes a turn. Yeah, so one of the they go to activities, they get very tired and they join a discard pile and they refuse to leave it. They're just sat in there. You know, I mean, they, they've played some tennis. That's good enough for them for the whole season. They're now going to stare out of the window and mope over their beloved who has gone to war or something. Who knows? Maybe they'll mope over the local. So, um, so eventually, you need to get them back. And to do that, you have to pass, which means you're effectively saying, I'm not doing an activity this turn. Now, in the base game, passing actually doesn't feel great. Um, you get like £200 and you can buy a building. And you also get all your ready in the refreshed area, good to go. But that's it. The nice thing the expansion did was it allowed you to hire. And you could use your butler uh, to hire two staff. So that makes the pass turn so much more appealing because you go, oh, cool. Not only do I get to pass uh, and I can like, because you go, oh, cool. Not only do I get to pass uh, and I can like get all my guests back, but I still get to recruit some more staff. Yes, they're going to be exhausted and take two rounds before they're into the rotation, but that makes my turn feel more efficient. Or you can be like, I've got more than enough staff. Uh, these buildings are rubbish, refresh them. Efficient. Or you can be like, I've got more than enough staff. Uh, these buildings are rubbish, refresh them all. And draw new build, new new activities. Which, I, I when I play, I'm usually very aggressive with my reputation. I'll sacrifice my reputation for money. Or I'll sack it to refresh the builder's market, which discards all of the current activity tile, activity tiles and puts new ones out. And that is like essential if you have a, a, a victory point card that wants a specific room. Because if you don't go fishing for it, there's a lot of tiles in that game. And some of them don't even have duplicates. Some of them are one-offs. So, mm. 
Uh, yeah, which reminds me again, the objective cards. How does with the way you start with X amount and then you discard some and draw more and kind of try to hone your objective cards to your um, I, to match? I really like that you can multiple time prune uh, which one you want to keep, which one you, you think uh, are interesting. It's a bit annoying maybe that you can't see coming to the game. Like if it was, uh, if they were all laid out and just popped in one at a time until the, the as the game continues, maybe it would make it be easier to feel like, oh, the, the library is going to play come into play at some point. I could try to, to buy it later. Um, the, the fact that it was all in the buy it later, um, the, the fact that it was all in a, in a random pile was just maybe a little bit frustrating because at one point I discarded a, a card that I could have done uh, if I knew it would come uh, come up later. But otherwise, I really like the fact that you can just prune them and kind of... I really like the fact that you can just prune them and kind of... Uh, make them correspond to the play that you're currently doing rather than have to adjust your play to fit those cards. Well, funnily enough, there are variants at the back of the book which uh, can solve that. Or you can even have a non-deterministic um, view of it. So just as a few examples, one variant uh, has um, theme card... Oh, no, sorry, not the, the, here we are. Uh, each season, the builder's market refreshes at the start of the season. So that pr increases the turnover, making those rarer oh. things. Yeah. Or you can have one where the cheapest tile, get rid of it, slide everything down, see more built, small tiles. Oh, that's so, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it kind of, and they've also included ones to do with um, switching up the courtship. And a there's a, de a non, de sorry, a deterministic version for two players as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan's thought of all of this and been like, hey, you can tailor your, and being like, hey, you can tailor your, building or courtship experience to fit what you want well that's that's just to prove that uh, obsession is a very well told of game yeah yeah it's... Um, yeah i, think it's uh, my I, favorite I, I had a question actually yep yeah i had a question actually yep yeah uh, i had a question actually uh how expensive it is because given the look and the size of it i don't think that it ought to be uh, very expensive. Seventy euros. Oh, that's a bit more than. What I, I, I knew. Like. I knew this answer. All right. I, I, I knew. Like. I knew this answer. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's seventy euros, and upstairs, downstairs is around fifty euros. The Wessex expansions between twenty-five and thirty euros. The promotional tiles are uh, about ten to fifteen euros, and the useful box, if you can find it, is about ten euros. So it's, it's with hand-stitched bags. It's the, the production quality is fantastic. The As I said, my only quibble okay. is not with the build or the design, like the tiles are thick and nice. It's just I'd like I'd like to see a new set of artwork that really makes this game sing as much as... Because obviously when you watch yeah. BBC or period dramas, visually, like they have a certain aesthetic. This captures a lot of it, but I think, I think it could have been a bit further. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a shame that it's... Uh, how are the, uh, the activity tiles? Are they cardboard then? Like they're very thick... Uh, the activity tiles, are they cardboard then? Like they're very thick cardboard? Thick cardboard, yeah. Very satisfying, uh, okay. well, well printed on both sides and clear. I see. Well, regardless, it was uh, very fun to play, and I uh, I probably will try to to play it again at some point because I play, and I uh, I probably will try to to play it again at some point because I I truly enjoyed it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. I'm going to be returning to it more times this year. I'm going to be showing it to the in-laws, one of whom is very excited because she loves uh, period dramas and the fact <laughs> that the game game is so light and breezy to operate uh it's already been described to her and she's like i can't i can't wait to have a go this is gonna be you know, very yeah. very very role-playing heavy it's it's a game i would uh, happily replay uh but i wouldn't buy it honestly oh, that's but that's yes. the game where uh if no one in my surroundings had it i would shrug and okay yeah i i love it so much that i might ask my mother when she visits next 
um, to bring over a load of pound coins and two pound coins from the UK so oh. I can just change out the card oh. for real currency. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that. Uh, so that you're going to make your board game even uh, more expensive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to bling it out with the queen's pounds. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Well, I think it's time. So we go on uh, and finish our wandering through and get into creating thought-provoking masterpieces by numbers. So it's time for Alessio with Canvas and Canvas Reflections. Yeah. Uh... In Canvas, basically, you create masterpieces. You, every player is a painter and uh, is competing in an art festival. Uh, is uh, uh, a very chilling experience of creating art. And, uh, well, uh, we'll see how to evaluate it. It's actually a very cool game. It's uh, the original Canvas, I think it was uh, between 2019-2020. It's by Jeffrey Chin and Andrew Nerger. I think that a lot of praise has to be uh, paid to Luan Huin, and I hope uh, I pronounced the name correctly, who is the artist of the game and made so art so cool, which brings the game really to life in a in a great way but let's talk about the game basically in canvas you are a painter and you have to create three paintings you begin by getting a big card which is a background you choose the background they have no effect whatsoever except being pretty and you put it into a big sleeve then that into a big sleeve then there's there's a central market of five cards in the base game and there are uh, uh, at the beginning of the game you just decide four ways of scoring which are scoring cards drawn randomly or decided beforehand scoring which are scoring cards drawn randomly or decided beforehand which give you a way in which you can score each of four colored ribbons which are uh, red green uh, blue and purple each ribbon is worth one victory each ribbon is worth one victory point at the end and the cards give you the way uh, in which you score uh, after that you have uh, uh, five cards at the center uh, of the central market which are all the same and uh, uh, colored swatches with symbols the symbols are the way you score uh, colored swatches can be repeated can be uh, posed one over the other the cards are transparent except for the illustration the illustration can be every uh, floating balloons people attached to balloons teddy bears uh, tea and kettle uh, piles of books, uh, skulls, uh, poisons, uh, beverages, uh, brides. Actually, you have a lot of subjects uh, which uh, can bring you have a lot of subjects uh, which uh, can bring you uh, c can bring a, a, both an abstract or a very 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 uh, literal painting to life. Uh, you can buy up to three of these cards for each painting. And then you just compose the painting by deciding to three of these cards for each painting. And then you just compose the painting by deciding the cards, uh, by putting the cards over the background in the sleeve and composing it. You'll end up with a, with a set of swatches below, with, uh, below with, uh, with, a set, uh, with a set of symbols which are compared through scoring uh, so that you can get the ribbons and that's basically how you play when everyone has done three paintings the game ends uh, you just the ribbons the silver ribbons which are kind of special are worth two points and they have special scoring conditions and uh, the the player the painter with most ribbons wins now, uh, the game is very simple. The central market has a special uh, uh, mechanic which is uh, common to, 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 to market games in general, which is basically you can get the first card for free. 
and uh, all the other cards you pay a kind of currency which is inspiration in this game but they are basically money you uh, to get the second card one car one uh, inspiration token on the first card and then you take the second if you want to can't, to... yeah can't you tell that he's a programmer it's like inspiration's basically money yeah <laughs> brilliant that, that... brilliant that's that's a great way to describe art yeah uh, actually programmers are kind of artists sure artists who who, who p push coins in their head and put out <laughs> programs by your definition I, i'm trying to explain a game fan here help me yeah i know <laughs> i i know you're trying to explain a game which has centuries little uh, bidding mechanics for the market and has gloomhaven's transparent cards uh, it actually it actually works like it actually works works all world for the powers or for example uh, impact spammer for the cards you just pay for the card you don't want to choose so people who get the those cards get more inspiration and get to buy more stuff uh, the game is very simple it plays very fast i think five players uh, which is the is like 30 minutes and the game is very fun because of what you can create uh, I don't know uh, how you are familiar, uh, how much you are familiar with the game, but basically you can create stuff like I, I once created on a very very dark background. I put on a bride ground. I put on a bride in a full bridal dress and a bottle of poison uh, with a skull on top and confetti everywhere. It was called Sweet Celebration. It was a very, very abstract a piece of art. <laughs> that's not abstract. That's that's like It was a very, very abstract a piece of art. <laughs> that's not abstract. That's that's like a that's metaphor. Really it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very very clear metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I uh, I I gotta say like this game has that whim I, I I gotta say like this game has that whimsical element that kind of Dixit and Mysterium have where people engage with the artwork and the layered cards is super cool because first time I encountered transparent cards was in Gloomhaven where you stick them on top of each other to like change the fates of your family members and it oh, and some cards interact with the stuff you got in hand so people can always see what cards you've got in hand here the clear transparent layered cards you put three on top of each other ah well chef's chef's kiss artist's kiss yes yeah. it's fantastic yeah actually the, the the idea is very smart and the, and the gimmick is very fun to play actually happy of creating just of just creating art you you really don't care if you win or lose because you create fun stuff you you can be you you, you can do something humorous you can try to genuinely create art you can just uh, compose something beautiful and that's uh, oh, you yeah you can try to score of course but uh, i i'm told i'm a programmer because of that so we won't talk about uh, <laughs> currency scoring uh, and how you get points. You just beep boop boop beep beep. <laughs> yeah. You want to be less of a programmer and more of a robo kettle. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's uh, that we, we which came out uh, recently. I, I think uh, we could call it uh, late it's, 2021. It's not really out yet. It's on distribution to backers because you've received yours and yeah. mine is still in transit. Okay, because I, I thought mine was late, so. Uh, it's still in distribution and it's reflect which is uh, kind of more of the same with another twist it adds two elements to the to the game which is uh, more cards of which you won't get enough uh, they are uh, curious inventive uh, and even more fun and they can be mirrored like you buy a and just flip it and they have the exact reverse of it with new art and a new definition. So uh, it adds a lot of depth to the game. Uh, you get a new mat, a new board for playing in which you can, in which the central market uh, gets bigger because it gets uh, to eight instead of five. And uh, other than that, you have a new symbol, which is the gold medal. The gold medal is kind of the silver medal in for uh, because you have uh, a special way of scoring that medal but it's worth three points and it works only on adjusting that medal but it's worth three points and it works only on adjacency 
uh, for swatches so that if you got for example in the central swatch which is the green one uh, it works only if you fulfill the condition on the two adjac adjacent swatch which is the yellow and the blue one the condition on the two adjac adjacent swatch which is the yellow and the blue one uh, it adds a, a bit more of complexity, of course the game uh, still stays very simple, very fast, but uh, adds new layer of possible art you can create and, uh, and fan you of a non-scoring bot, which is uh, Vincent. <laughs> Actually, your friendly, your friendly painter w w doesn't score and uh, it uh, works as a bot player uh, which randomizes what you get and where you put inspiration tokens for two or solo players. Yeah. It I... sounds really fun. I've, I've not played it or heard it, uh, about it much, but it sounds really good, uh, especially since I really like Mysterium. So, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's probably, it's probably one game you would like if you like Mysterium. Uh, I say I, I'd say, but it can be forgiven because it's all of the gimmick. I think. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have transparent cardboard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we we could have, but it's very very expensive and it looks like us. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I have. Uh, anyway, uh, I have to say. Uh, is kind of lacking in longevity unless you are a very creative person so i'm a programmer i am not like that <laughs> i'll eventually get tired of this but it's a very very not like that <laughs> i'll eventually get tired of this but it's a very very cool game yeah see i disagree on that front uh, I think this has a fairly le a fairly decent level of longevity because the point scoring system where you're trying to maximize each of the four categories for the icons cover each other up as you lay them down at the bottom makes for quite a deep experience. This is a game that somebody can just play by slapping the layers together and going, look at me, I've played Endless Pleasure. Yeah. Ooh, look at it, isn't it pretty? And then get zero points. I've played a game with somebody who scored five points across the entire game time. He didn't care. And usually he gets a bit <laughs> bummed when he does badly in a board game. Um, like, but this time he was just like, you know what? I don't care. I had so much fun. Let's go again. And he scored about 10 points. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you don't great? care about points. That's the best I about do. this game. Yeah, of course. You, <laughs> but... you get past, you get past the ooh. Yeah, of course. You, <laughs> but... you get past, you get past the ooh, these are pretty layer things. And you get on to like, how well can I score these? And then once you've got the icons lined up, you look at the painting after and go oh, actually that looks really cool as well nice yeah i, I would be of the kind to look at the icons and then I put my great uh, by any chance yeah I, I would be of the kind to look at the icons and then I put my great uh, by any chance uh, uh what uh, i'm sorry what <laughs> fan uh, was it greg that had a wonderful time oh greg loves this game greg loves this game greg loves obsession i, no, I, I, I can't even Le greg's really good at Le Greg's really good at this game. Okay, okay. He, I, I can imagine Greg just having a wonderful time despite having, getting no points. Of course. No, no. Uh, Greg's Greg's super onto games like this. He plays um, uh, Mysterium a lot. Uh, he plays oh. Dixit a fair amount. Um, so this kind of thing he loves. Uh, he's on a very limited income, so he couldn't. He had to cancel his pledge in the end. Um, which is a shame, oh, well. uh, but he'll pick it up in the stores. He's just a bit sad because he misses out on the wooden tokens for the um, rosettes that you get. But I mean, they're just wooden tokens. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would be the kind of person picking up cards based on the symbols for uh, on top of each other. And oh, I miscalculated. Yeah, uh, th that's uh, a bit of a special pu of a special puzzle because you have to uh, sometimes you just uh, uh, go over a swatch with the symbol you wanted with another swatch and you have no way of putting the other below because superimposed. So that's actually the smart part of the game. Yes, 
it's really challenging because it, we don't often think about puzzles where you're covering something up with the next layer and then you have to do another layer on top of that so it, you're actually having to think in three dimensions in order to put these layers together which is why i'm like this game because there's a, a variety of different um like objectives can be dealt out and the new cards in reflections looks like it's going to add a whole ton more yeah. and a chance to play with it uh i i think considering this game is so easy to get into it's and very fast to play it's kind of nice um in that it reminds me in some ways you played arboretum on the weekend and i forgot about that but arboretum's super easy to get into because on your turn you play a tree you draw like two cards you play one of them you discard a card and then as you start playing, you realize, actually, there's a load of strategy in here. It's not just making a nice, pretty grid of very lovely illustrated trees. This game is mean as heck. <laughs> and I'm not sure how often you've experienced when you play and somebody picks up a card and you're just like, you swine. That was the only one I wanted. And then you're sat there waiting for the symbol to turn up again. And you have to just cut your losses because it's time to paint a painting because you've got five cards in hand and you can't pick up any more. Um, I I, um, I I really like this game a lot. Yeah, I have to say the game economy kind of clicks because you have uh, uh, not a lot of inspiration tokens to begin with, but uh, every player buying stuff makes uh, the currency circulate uh, uh, correctly. Stuff makes uh, the currency circulate uh, uh, correctly. So it's it kind of clicks really it's a uh, oiled clockwork it works of course uh, i am be i am being a programmer again so i will just shut up um <laughs> i think it's all programmer again so i will just shut up um <laughs> i think it's also worth mentioning that uh, and i'm just going to you should Google this, uh, take a look. But for those of you who have not seen it, the expansion box and the main box are designed to look like paintings. And they have mounting on the back to hang. actually continues the artwork on the core game box. So you can keep these in your games room on your wall when you're not playing with them. So not only are they a game and functionally a game, but they're also game art, which is yeah. just great. Yeah, it's so meta. Um, it is, although I will say once we get some like very good ways of fixing them to the wall, because if you have to put them on the wall above the dog's bed and then it falls off onto the dog, <laughs> she's not going to be very happy. And like I felt guilty for a week after that happened to her. Just theoretically speaking, right? No, it happened. It's no hyper, no hypothetical at all. Uh, cam it's no hyper, no hypothetical at all. Uh, canvas has landed on Pam while she was asleep. <laughs> and and, and it's kind of heavy, you know. Support? Pardon, Audrey? Did Pam destroy the books or did no? Or she... No, not even. No, pa so sweet. Pa Pam, Pam knows. In fact, instinctively knows to not. Pa so sweet. Pa Pam, Pam knows. In fact, instinctively knows to not chew anything that she's not given permission to do. She's a very good girl. She's never chewed a piece of a board game. Uh, I don't think she even would, but I don't leave anything on the floor. No, she just got very scared and then had to be comforted for the whole night. Oh. Which was... So, yeah, I think that's Canvas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then with that note, um, or, or stroke of the brush, this is all we have time for in this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Standy. Or as the last... Alessio? Bye-bye. Audrey? À la prochaine! Ooh, very nice. And myself. And remember that the second E in Standy is for etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>